Good morning and welcome to Windcrest United Methodist Church. It's good to see all of you this morning. If you're visiting with us, a very special welcome. Whether you are visiting via Facebook or YouTube, we do have a few folks that are here in the congregation that are unable to access us on internet. Uh, so we do want to encourage you, please do be in worship. That's the ultimate goal that we all share, is a chance to be in worship. So if you're visiting with us online, a very special welcome. Please let us know that you're here. You can do that by checking in on top of the Facebook page, uh, liking our Facebook page. Uh, also, if you would like to just put it in the comments that you are here. We are working on other ways to acknowledge your presence with us and to communicate with us. And one of the ways that we're experimenting is if you would like to be a part of our Disciple Bible Study class, it is a nine-month survey class from Genesis all the way through Revelation. Uh, we would love to have you. But also, if you have taken the first Disciple class and want to take one of the other Disciple classes, please just take a moment. Or write this down. If you, uh, it will also be in the comment section at the top of our page or on top of this video. Please do text the word disciple to 210-817-7007. That will register your attendance with us here today, but also it will put you in a link so that you can let us know the times and dates that work best for you so that we can form those classes and what classes you're interested in. So again, we're working very hard to stay communicated to stay connected and to communicate with folks both online and in person. Next week is Communion Sunday, another one of those times that we are trying to continue to discover and discern what does it mean to be a worshiping community and how do we come together. So traditionally what we do is we invite you to pick up some communion elements on your trip to the store this week. We will do the great Thanksgiving and then you will break the bread that you have and take of the cup that you have and that is fully acceptable, and God is present in that. We believe that Jesus has been present virtually, and in that virtual presence with us for 2,000 years is the real presence, and especially we are notice of that in our communion service. However, I miss seeing you. I miss touching you. I miss giving you a handshake. I miss placing the bread into your hands. I can't do that still. However, I can meet you out under the covered drive between the two services, so probably about 9.15 to, no, let's see, 10.15 to 10.45. I'll be out underneath the awning with some communion elements, probably those individual, I will definitely have some of those individual communion elements with the wafer and the juice together, but I'll also, I'm still toying with this. Y'all can let me know what you think. Um, at least those. Maybe the bread and the juice as well so that I can hand it to you through the car window, then sanitize my hands and keep safe distance and all those sort of things. We've got to figure out a way through this. I believe that God is doing big things, miraculous things. I just don't know what they are yet. Okay? I believe that God is restructuring not just the world. This is a worldwide event. We are connected with people all over the world in ways that we have never been connected before, and I hope that we maintain that connection and that realization that we are all bound together. But I also think God is doing something huge in and through God's church. Again, I don't know what it is. But I pray that I stay open to hearing God's call and God's guidance and I pray that I continue to hear God's call and God's guidance through each and every one of you as well. We all have opinions. We all have things that we want, okay? And, and that's all part of that conversation, so we want to hear that. So again, next week is communion. We want to invite you to celebrate communion at your home. We believe that God is present in that, but if you would like to have that one-on-one -on -one interaction in some form of safe fashion in this new time, I will be out under the covered driveway between whatever I said, 10.15 to 10.45, maybe a little bit before, maybe a little bit after. Also, if you want to contribute to the offering at the back of the sanctuary near each one of the doors is an offering plate. If you want to do it in person, please do come in, drop your offering in there. There's one in the gathering place. Next week, I will be outside. I'll have an offering plate. If you want to drop off your offering, I'm out there anyway. We also have the upper rooms that are in. These are very tangible. You can hold them, touch them, feel them, all that. They are in the gathering place. 
They will also be outside next week, but you can also get those online. Everything that we're doing online, we are trying to set up in such a way that they continue after we found a vaccine, after we found an effective treatment plan for COVID-19. Because we have seen, and again, like I said, I believe God is changing the way the church interacts. We have seen our worship service in our community reach out further than it's ever reached before in a real and tangible way. Now, how do we maintain that community realizing that when people that were here three months ago, six months ago, and have now moved to someplace else, that they can stay connected with the community of faith and they can feel like they're part of a community. So we want to keep doing that, whatever that means, all right? Um, prayer concerns, put them in the comment section. I try to read those in between the two services so that I can transfer the 9 o'clock prayer concerns to the 11 o'clock service. Also, we have people that are monitoring them during the worship service that will offer up prayer, and each person that's watching this service can offer a prayer. Ones that I have received throughout the week. Harriet Martell, the COVID test came back negative, thanks be to God. However, she does have pneumonia. But can you imagine pneumonia and COVID? It's not COVID-related pneumonia. But please keep Harriet Martell and her daughter in your prayers. Ralph Goodlett's service will be tomorrow morning at 8.15 at sunset. Frankie Joe is still recovering from COVID. We give thanks for that, but it is hard. It is rough. It is not, oh, you wake up one morning and you're done. Uh, Nadine, our praise and worship leader for the 11 o'clock service, her grandmother's primary caregiver has tested positive and is out for at least a month. Uh, so Nadine is going back to Germany to take care of her grandmother, so she'll be out for the next four Sundays. And so please keep Nadine and her grandmother and uh, her grandmother's caregiver in your prayers. All of those affected by Hurricane Laura, if you've been watching the news, you know about the hurricane and continued weather-related events, whether it be storms, fires, floods, whatever it is, please keep those folks in your prayers. And those folks that respond, we are a church that has traditionally responded, and I'm sure we will continue to do so. Protesters and law enforcement, I pray for a peaceable kingdom when we can speak and not have to resort to violence on both sides. Please keep both prayer testers and all law enforcement in your prayers, and not just in the protest, but those people that stand for things and are willing to put their life out. Uh, Daniel's sister, our custodian here, our sextant, his sister, uh, we announced last week, was COVID positive. Uh, the hospital called, and they are taking her off the ventilator and giving her respiratory lung treatments, which is great news. Um, also, Shelby, uh, one of the granddaughters of one of our members, just uh, the COVID is affecting many people in many different ways, and it's affecting a lot of folks economically and socially. Uh, so please do keep Shelby and all of those that are dealing not directly with the virus of COVID, but indirectly with those that have the virus. Um, newsletter, online, and in the gathering place. Oh, and I'm way over. Okay, so we are not here to listen to me do announcements. If you have announcements, put them in the comments section. That way everybody can see them. I apologize for going over. We are here for worship. It is one of the things that the church does. That If you're in social justice, you probably don't worship. If you are in a community of, of fellowship, and that's for your purpose, you probably don't worship. We do both of those things. We are a community that supports and loves each other. There's a lot of them out there, but we worship. We are a community that believes in social justice and outreach and feeding our neighbor. We worship. So that's what we're about today, to listen to God, to let God speak in our lives, to learn about God, and to ask God to guide us to be faithful disciples. So Christian moment, uh, our mission moment this morning is Christian Assistance Ministries. Like I said, we are a church that reaches out, and this is the, one of the ways we do that. Rob, if you will show us the video. Our mission is to share the love of Christ by providing immediate assistance and encouragement to people in crisis. And it's just really been an amazing experience to see how our mission to be sort of an emergency room is greatly needed, that, that we had a process for helping people immediately and that we could quickly pivot to serve in a different way that was safe for not only our staff, 
but those we're serving. Nobody has turned their back on CAM when it's gotten hard. Nobody has said, I'm not going to put myself out there because it's dangerous. The mission has been the exact same. We need to help those that are in need, whether they be homeless, whether they be those that are not homeless. The mission remains the same, even stronger than it has been in the past. It's taught me more realization of life that just in a blink of an eye, everything could change and everything can turn around, but it's what you do with your day and what you do with your time that helps you keep on going. Thank you for all you've done and all the food you've given me and all the showers you let me take a shower. <laughs> God bless. <laughs> it helps me to see, you know, what God's purpose is for all of us and it helps me in my daily, just in the blessings that I see in my own life and the ability for me to feel like God is working for me to touch people's lives. I feel personal connections with them. I've met many of our clients and they've taught me things that I didn't know. They've showed me paths that I've never known about and working at CAM has taught me many things that I've never thought I would have learned at working at a ministry and I love it here. We really just can't thank everyone enough for their willingness to help us make an operation like CAM possible. CAM serves 50,000 people on an annual basis. We were able to step up and serve people in crisis during this pandemic. And we just can't thank you and the San Antonio community enough for your financial contributions, your prayers, your volunteer hours, your cleaning out your closets, and your donations. We couldn't do this without you. On the behalf of everybody, we give our thanks to Cam, Christian Assistance Ministry. Appreciations. We are here to love one another, to love our neighbor as ourselves and to love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, and all our strength. And so, Debbie, if you would offer your gift of music so that we can center ourselves and open our hearts to the power of the Holy Spirit and our ears to the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Good morning. Please stand and join me in our call to worship. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call on his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him. Sing praises to him. Tell of all his wonderful works. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his presence continually. But we have to listen. And so we join in this prayer of confession and pardon. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. 
We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Hear these words of assurance, and may they be written upon your heart. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. And the people said, Amen. So as we remember those, and may this prayer of confession, if it calls somebody to mind that you may have overlooked, or something that you... Uh, need to be reminded of God's grace and forgiveness. First off, start with your greeting of other people. Remember the traditional greeting of the others was a sign of reconciliation. You went to people that you needed to be reconciled with at this point and said, peace be with you, and then they responded back, peace with you. So start with that. Just say a prayer for those folks and offer them peace within your heart and accept God's peace within your own heart. Now remember all of those that you've seen on TV that have challenged your heart, wherever they are, whoever they are, whatever it is, and offer peace to them. And hear the peace returned from you to you by Jesus Christ. And now turn to one another wherever you are. And, and hopefully you've not offended anybody here outwardly and openly, but it is nice in case by error or omission uh, we have offended. God's peace be with you. God's peace be with you. God's peace be with you. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Please be seated. Gracious and eternal God, we have so much to pray about. When we watch TV, when we turn on the radio, we can't go to the grocery store without being confronted, it seems like, without being challenged, without feeling like we have to make some major life and death decision, that if we behave this way, then we're endorsing one school of thought. If we behave another way, we're endorsing another school of thought. So be with the leaders all over the world, those that you have called and equipped to be leaders and to lead others, not just by edict and mandate, but by example by attitude, by being the leader. And we as Christians pray that all use the leadership of Jesus Christ as example for all leaders of the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all of those on the front line fighting this virus, fighting wildfires, pushing back the destruction of hurricanes, but also keep us mindful of other countries where there's still famine, there's still flood, there's still civil unrest, there's still human trafficking, people buying and selling other people, and people selling themselves to others because they believe that's the only way to receive a better life. Lord, help us to take up our cross and follow you. And in following you, may we lead others. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. So we pray for each other. We pray for those that we see in the grocery store, those behind the plexiglass shield. We pray for those that are told to just shut up and go to work, that work in hazardous situations so that we can have a cut-up piece of meat, nicely packaged, where we don't have to deal with what they have to deal with. We pray for all who operate businesses, all who employ others, that they may love their neighbor as themselves. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we pray for all who work for someone else, who show up day after day. We pray that the decisions they make are decisions of justice and mercy, that they work in an environment that is affirming of your kingdom, the peaceable kingdom, 
that is uplifting to human dignity of all. We pray for those who are sick. We pray for those who care for them. We pray for those who have a long recovery ahead of them. And we pray for those that will never fully recover. They may always have shortness of breath. They may always walk with a limp. They may never be able to play with their children, their grandchildren, or their toys the way they did before. We pray for those who have finished their course in faith and now rest from their labors. We pray for all who grieve and mourn. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We do not pray alone, Almighty God. You pray with us. You pray for us. You pray that our hearts might be opened, our ears might hear, our eyes may see. You pray that we recognize your provisions. You pray that we remember your holy kingdom. You pray that as we experience trials and tribulations, that we will stand faithful. So hear us as you pray for us, and we join you in that prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I invite you now to stand as you are able as we join in this traditional version of this historical profession of faith, as we are reminded of who we are and whose we are. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sin, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. <laughs> Please be seated. Please join me in our offertory prayer. God of compassion, sometimes we are reluctant to follow your divine authority and to place our entire trust in you. We feel more secure trusting in our own ability and our own strength. Thank you for this moment in our worship service when we are reminded of your unwavering, steadfast love engulfs us like a mother's gentle caress. Bless these gifts and we who give them, trusting in our heavenly grace, we pray. Amen. to care. 
please join me in our prayer of illumination. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. So we continue to make our way through the gospel according to Matthew. This week we pick up immediately where we stopped last week. If you remember last week, then he sternly ordered the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. Uh, that's always a, a curious statement, but we might find out why uh, in this next section. So reading from Matthew 16, beginning with verse 21. From that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord, this must never happen to you. But Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Then Jesus told his disciples, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit them if they gain the whole world but forfeit their life? Or what will they give in return for their life? For the Son of Man is to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay everyone for what has been done. Truly, I tell you, there are you, some standing here, who will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning, friends. I'm glad to see you. I hope you had a good week at school. I hope that you were patient with yourself and with your parents and with your teachers who are doing really new things. Thanks, teachers. Um, and I also hope that at some point this week you had a chance to think about that story we started talking about last week about Moses. Because I told you we were going to hang out with him for a while and we're still with him today. So remember that Moses' story is in the book of Exodus. That's in the Old Testament. And last week we were in the first chapter and this week we've gone all the way to the third chapter. Um, there's some places in the middle, I want you to read them at home, that aren't in today's lectionary. But in today's lectionary, we've gone all the way through Moses' life. He grew up, made some really bad choices, um, ends up out in a field, and God calls Moses to do some work for Moses. And that's really today's scripture. And Moses, right, who, remember, I told you, he made some bad choices, and he has probably had a really deep understanding of what it means to be forgiven by God. And then God says, hey, Moses, I need you to do something for me. Now, what do you think you would say if you had made a really bad choice and then God forgave you and then God asked you to do something? This is a little bit like if you made a bad choice at home and mom talked to you about it. You said you were sorry. She forgave you. And then mom said, and I need you to take the trash out. You think you would take the trash out? I, I would take the trash out. So God says, hey, Moses, I need you to do something for me. And Moses says, no, thank you. And then God says, no, no, Moses, I need you to do something for me. And Moses says, I, I can't do that. And then God says, you know what, Moses? This is not about you doing it alone. This is about us doing it together. And that's really the way God works. I know you're thinking, Miss Cursita, you keep telling me this every Sunday. And it's because God keeps telling us every time we open the Bible, even in the stuff Pastor Jim read in the gospel. Remember, last week, Peter was going to get the church built on him. And this week, Jesus says, that's a really bad choice. 
And then you know what happens? He gets another chance to keep being what God wants him to be, just like we do. So if it was a bad week, a hard week, if you made some bad choices, dust it off. That's what we say in our family. Try to make it right. Start again. No, you're not alone. God's there with you. Will you pray with me? Dear God, thanks for giving me second chances. Well, more than seconds. <laughs> Help me remember that I don't do this alone. That together we can be who you want us to be. Thanks for Moses and for Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Christina. Thank you, Kristen, for that prayer and the song. John, thank you for that beautiful song. And thank you, uh, Tim, for Second Chances. Uh, so last week, uh, Tim is our sound engineer. Last week, I got a text that said, I can hear the fan again. We had to use a fan for a while when we didn't have our air conditioning. And Christina and I looked at each other and thought, the fan's not running. What I realized was I had my mask over my microphone, so as I was breathing, they were hearing that out on the Internet. So I had taken my mask off so that I could speak. So today I thought I'm going to be smarter. I'm going to put my microphone on after I put my mask on. Well, I forgot. And so Tim's back there. I can hear him trying to find me uh, because my mic's back over here someplace. So he finally found me. And so if we came in late, it's not Tim's fault. It's my fault. Uh, but I also forgot to light the candles. So it's been one of those days. Thank God for second chances. Today, as I kind of alluded to before I read the gospel reading, last week Jesus says, then he sternly ordered the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. And I think the reason that these two texts go together is because there is a cost to Messiahship. There is a cost to Messiahship. And I think people ought to know the cost before they commit to following Jesus now, in today's gospel, it says, take up your cross. Now, I don't know about you, but when I was growing up, taking up my cross meant eating my broccoli. All right? My mother would want me to eat my vegetables. More importantly, I grew up in a family where we cleaned our plate, okay? And so taking up my cross was oftentimes eating things that I had put on my plate. I got to put whatever I wanted on my own plate within reason, including broccoli and Brussels sprouts and that canned asparagus. Have you ever had that stuff? Okay, I like the fresh stuff. Okay, I don't want to go too far down all that stuff, all right? And that was taking up my cross. Later, it was making my bed, mowing the yard, going to visit a relative that I didn't want to go see. Those were just things you did because you were family. Then, in my high school and teenage years, it was going to class, doing homework that I didn't want to do, putting up with this person or that teacher. Now it's, you know, wearing a mask, having to keep social distance in the grocery store, not being able to do what I want to do when I want to do it. And that all may sound like bearing your burdens is taking up your cross, but that's not it at all. When Jesus turns to Peter and says, and all the other disciples, and tells his disciples to take up their cross, that was a symbol of execution. That meant you had been sentenced to death. In the Roman world, in that day and time, if you picked up your cross, you were carrying it to your own crucifixion. It wasn't just some burden or hardship or inconvenience. Joel Marcus, in his commentary on Mark, refers us back to Alexander Solonitsyn when he speaks about the gulag. Remember the gulag? All of you all old enough to remember at least reading about the gulag? He says, From the moment you go to prison, you must put your cozy past firmly behind you. At the very threshold, you must say to yourself, My life is over. A little early, to be sure, 
but there's nothing to be done about it. I shall never return to freedom. I no longer have any property whatsoever. Only my spirit and my conscience remain precious and important to me. When I was working in a residential treatment center for adolescents, one of the things that I would say sometimes in conversations what rights do you have that someone can't take away from you? What rights and privileges do you have that weren't given to you by someone else and therefore can't be taken away by another person? Our spirit and our conscience. Who we are and whose we are and who we let govern us. That's all we have. Confronted by a prisoner that believes in those things, torture and interrogation is useless. It will not work. Only the person who has renounced everything, he goes on to say, can win that victory. I remember hearing about a missionary in South America. He was preaching texts that were not popular with the people in power. So they arrested him. They beat him. They put him through realignment, whatever that's called. Thank goodness I don't know what that's called. And they let him go. And you know what that fool did? He did it again. He began to preach the gospel, and the government believed that the gospel was counter to their agenda, and it was. And so you guessed it, they arrested him again, and they beat him, and they let him go, and you know what that fool did? He did it again, but this time he started taping them. He started taping his sermons. And people were making copies of the sermons. And they were giving them to their friends. And when they got through listening to them, they were giving them to their friends. And when they got through listening to them, they were giving them to their friends. And they brought him back in and they held up one of these tapes. And they said, do you know what we could do to you with this? We now have proof of what you're saying. Do you know what we could do to you for this? And he said, yes, you could have me executed. He said, yes. What do you think of that? And he said, I don't believe you will, but go ahead if you'd like. And what makes you think you're so powerful that we won't? And he said, because if you do, every word on that tape will be validated by my actions and by the blood of Jesus Christ. And they will take on new power and new authority. When we lay down our life, when we take up our cross, we renounce everything that can win the victory over the grace and love of Jesus Christ. I think the reason Jesus told his disciples, don't tell people I'm the Messiah, is one, because they didn't fully understand what that meant. Two, you better know the price before you buy the product. People who are afraid, afraid of dying, let me back that up. People who are no longer afraid of dying basically fall into two categories, don't they? When we can genuinely say, I am no longer afraid of what the world can do to me. I am no longer afraid of dying. We're going to fall into one or two categories. One of those is there is nothing you can do to me worse than what's already being done to me, so I'm going to do whatever in hell, literally, Hades, we talked about that last week, whatever in hell I want. Because you can't scare me. I've got nothing left to lose. 
The other side of that is, there is nothing you can do to me that's stronger than God's love for me and God's love for you. And so, if you make choices counter to the gospel, God is still God. If you are threatened, because if we let in too many people that are different than we are, they might take our culture and move it in a direction that I don't want to go. God will still be God. If we can't open up our churches and go against... No, I'm not going to say that. That's pejorative. Try not to do that. If we are afraid that people will quit coming to church if we don't do something, then fear takes control. But God will still be God if we don't get it right. I believe God is doing something powerful in the church. I'm just not sure what it is. And we have two choices. One is I want what I want and I'm willing to do whatever I have to do to get it and I don't care. Or two, even if I'm wrong, God is still God. And I can put my wants aside. When I read Romans 12, 9 through 21, which is our appointed epistle for today, I think this might be the best of what there is that reminds us of what we're called to be. To love truly and to love even more generously than the next person to seek out goodness and to turn away from evil, to be untiring, to never quit in our service to God, and to be hopeful and steadfast even when we're, we're disappointed, frustrated, or angry, to always be compassionate and humble. And these goals are universal and timeless. These instructors are the real deal. This is what people are talking about when they say that the New Testament is about love and forgiveness. And when we get to verse 19, where Paul says that we are to extend this generosity to people who would do us harm, quote, leave room for the wrath of God we're reminded of the cost of discipleship. There is so much that we can do. There is so much that we can share. There is so much hope that we can live in. There's enough for everyone. God is still God. And God will be God. And we don't have to be afraid that some group is going to take over. We don't have to be afraid that if we're not the oppressor, then we will be the oppressed. We don't have to be afraid that if it's not enough for me, then it's not enough for somebody else that if we're not the majority, then we'll be the minority. If we're not the one administering suffering, then we might be the one undergoing suffering. Because we have faith. We have faith that we lead by example. We lead by our beliefs. We live by the way we live our life. And when we stretch the truth to make a point, or we say my rights are more important than somebody else's rights, or my being in power and control is more important than somebody else having control, then that's the message we proclaim. 
we can hope and live for justice because God is just. We can extend gracious hospitality to the stranger, compassion to the suffering, and friendship no matter what because God declared, I am. I am. I am partners with ordinary human beings. I am. I am able to do extraordinary things. I am. Moses was full of doubt. I can't, he said. And God said, no, but I am. I am. Matthew 16. For the Son of Man is to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay everyone for what has been done. Truly I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. We hear a lot about fear today, don't we? If we do this, those people will do that. If we don't do this, then this will happen. If we don't yell louder, then they will win. There's not enough to go around, it says. But we know there is, and we know that God is still God. We know that God will guide us through. I don't know whether it was Archbishop Romero in El Salvador or Bishop Tutu in Apartheid, or MLK dealing with racism in the 60s. Maybe it was all three. I don't know. But Emma Laser said it first, as far as I can tell. But I'll tell you a story. Whoever it was was preaching a sermon, and the soldiers came in and gathered around the wall. Just imagine. Maybe they're armed militia. Maybe they're neighbors, but they're armed. And you know they don't like what's being said. And whoever it was continued in the pulpit. And they said, some of us are free. And the congregation replied back, some of us are free. Then he pointed to the people that had gathered sitting in the pew, and he said, some of us are not free. And they replied back, some of us are not free. And then he looked at the group, and this is what Emma said. Until all of us are free. And the congregation responded back, until all of us are free. And then he pointed to the soldiers and said, none of us are free. And the congregation responded back. And the soldiers responded back, none of us are free. Until we are all free, we are none of us free. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit them if they gain the whole world but forfeit their life? Or what will they give in return for their life? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be. To God. Amen. It makes a difference when we profess our faith and become a member of, the community, of a community of faith. We enter a set of vows. One of those vows is do we put our whole trust in God's grace and promise to serve Him in union with the church which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races? Do we put our whole trust 
in God's grace? Do we believe there is nothing in life and death and life beyond death that can separate us from the love of God through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ? Because, now granted, it's hard. It's hard. And, and, and most of us are moving in that direction. If you've gotten there 100%, I want to have coffee with you. And if coffee's on the now drink list, tell me what we can have. But we're on the journey together. We're on the journey because God so loved us that God said, let me come show you how. So if you want to make this your church home, let us know. Send us a comment in the comment section. Send me an email. Walk down the aisle. However you want to let me know. But now let us stand and sing our hymn of invitation. More love to thee, O Christ. It's 453 if you have a hymnal. able to present you faultless before God's almighty throne, the one that can outlove you forever. The power of the Holy Spirit, which equips us to just keep trying, even though we can't outlove God. And the communion of all the saints, those you like, those you don't like, those that make you feel good, and those that you wish would just disappear, go with you. As you go forth from this place, go forth knowing you are loved. Amen.